I hope you guys are in a good mood because we're going to talk about suicide for a little bit. We are really going to talk about suicide for a little bit. Just say so you now, okay? Uh, when you when you talk with people um, about suicide, um, typically you're going to have one or two different things that they say. But two of the things that I kind of want to focus on is a lot of times people don't actually want to commit suicide. They just want the pain to stop. And sometimes if people are able to get past that stage, you get to another place of being completely dead where they don't really feel much anymore. And then they come into the second uh, big one that I want to talk about of why people want to commit suicide because they're just tired of living, you know, they don't really feel anything. They haven't felt anything for a while. I should have inserted a funny joke here. That, that, would, have, that would have lightened the mood, maybe. Uh, last year, and I guess it's two, two years ago because we're in 2022. Oh, my goodness. In, two, in 2020, just in the U.S., 46,000 people died of suicide. For those of you who are good at math, not me. <laughs> but there are people out there who are good at math, and some people, legend tells, who are actually enjoy it, would know that that would equal out to one suicide every 11 minutes. And for those of you who are observant, you know that that would mean that three that three committed suicide since the beginning of the service. But of those 46,000 people that actually did it, there were 12.2 that seriously considered it. 12.2 million. That's more than some states have as their entire population. That's more than some states put together have of their entire population. There's many causes of suicide. I'll mention four specifically. Um, one big cause of, of suicide is depression, which, duh, you could probably figure that one out yourself. Um, severe depression, usually ongoing. Not always, though. Sometimes it can be just a bout of depression that would have otherwise gone away by itself. The second is uh, loneliness. Severe loneliness is in the case of the elderly who don't have anyone to visit them. Or youth, teenagers who don't really feel like they can connect with anybody. The third one, which might come as a shock to you, is actually caused by accident. Um, this is where somebody does something to commit suicide, not knowing that it would actually result in their death. Misinforma misinformation about um, what's dangerous and what is not. Things like overdoses and stuff. And the last of the four is, uh, is surprising to me, too. I know that a lot of people, you know, especially at a younger, more impressionable age, are more prone to um, do attempted suicides for attention. I, I, I understand that. But, however, I bet you didn't know that actually a good number of suicides were caused by people who were doing it for attention, but accidentally actually killed themselves. And... Um, I have a long history of depression, those kinds of things, and suicidal thoughts and whatnot. Um, I, I would say that uh, it's good to be in church. I would say that. And I would say that uh, if you notice a lot of these things, COVID didn't do much to help. 
And I'm not talking about the actual sickness of COVID. I'm talking about the whole being in your house bit of it. Um, loneliness. This next generation is already very disconnected. They are uh, very much so on their screens and stuff. Very, very disconnected. And uh, surprise, surprise, when you tell people to stay in their house, it causes severe feelings of loneliness, severe feelings of depression, especially when you tell them that they're all going to die, and really pretty much no matter what they're going to do, they're still going to get this sickness and die anyways. And so they do everything you tell them to. They, they take a shot. They take boosters. They stay inside, and then they still end up getting it, and they feel kind of cheap, cheap, cheap shotted about it. It can get a little bit depressing. But, you know, what I want to talk about tonight isn't just suicide. We're not talking about suicide awareness, um, although that's a good thing to know about. I'll tell you this again at the end, but just, just for your own info, the suicide hotline's number has changed. It is now 988. 988. It's just like 911, right? But instead, it's 988. You can remember because there's a number right next to it, 988, okay? I'll tell you that again at the end, but just in case anybody needs it. Um, so we're not just talking about the hopelessness that is suicide. We are also talking about beyond that, but well, that's pretty much what we're talking about for the next four weeks is the idea of why you shouldn't commit suicide, why you shouldn't give up in life in general. Maybe you're not suicidal, but you're just facing kind of wanting to give up your ministry, your, your, your life, your marriage, whatever it is, just wanting to give up. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next uh, tonight and three week, three more weeks after tonight, um, the idea of not giving up. And, you know, there is hope. Uh, sometimes it's harder to find than at other times, but it is always still there. Um, and I know that because, well, I've been there. So I'm not telling you about something I haven't gone. Like, hey, uh, let me give you the directions to, uh, you know, Arkansas. I've never been there, but, you know, let me tell you to get there. You know, I, I actually have, you know, been there. And so I can tell you that there is actually hope, that there is actually light at the end of the tunnel. And some things you just have to kind of weather the storm. I know that's not the most encouraging thing to say, but some things you just have to weather. And, uh, you know, it, it, it passes sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't, but either way, you still have to weather it. Um, things like this, they never have a quick, easy fix. Everybody thinks that they can have this quick, easy fix that you can't. But I will give you a few little things that the Bible says over the next couple weeks and reasons that the Bible says not to give up. And once again, we're not just looking at as it applies to suicide, because I understand not everybody here is suicidal. <laughs> I mean, for those of you who are married, you're probably suicidal. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. But anyways, so the first little tidbit that I'll give you for free is that they did a study. And if you read your Bible four times a week, just four times, not every day, just four times a week, it decreases your chance of, having, uh, of experiencing severe loneliness by 30%. It's a pretty easy fix. Just read it four days a week. It's not bad. I don't care how busy you are. That's for the for that kind of a, a payback. Thirty percent less loneliness for just four days. Man, that's easy. Sign me up. And uh, another thing that was on there was loneliness. You you know another thing that that's good about church. And I'm not just talking about watching church online. That you can't hug people online. I'm talking about going to church in person. Um, not, not to not to downgrade. You know, if there's people who are um, you know, not really comfortable with getting out. You know, online's great. If you're sick, okay, that's great. You know, all those different things. But there comes a point when you do have to kind of leave your your comfort zone of your house because life isn't meant to live, be lived in the house. <laughs> I was actually reading a quote that said, uh, it was from Proverbs, and it said, to work the field first and then to build your house. Kind of as it applies to this, maybe go outside and experience life and then go inside. <laughs> but anyways... Um, so another thing that, that, that the church has to offer us is to make Christian friends, people who we know, we all believe the same basic core of the same thing. I mean, we might disagree on the specifics, but the general thing is there, you know. We can all be Republicans or Democrats or, you know, wherever else you come from, and it's totally fine because we all have that same thing binding us, rich and poor, black and white. We all have the same thing, Jesus Christ. So um, as long as we have that binding thread, um, we have something to share and something to connect to. And uh, I know that you wouldn't know this if you spend a lot of time on the YouTube comment section, but it's actually good to have friends who disagree with you on some things. It causes you to grow, causes you to challenge your beliefs. Nowadays, we just want to be around a bunch of people like us, and it kind of dumbs us down. Um, but so then another thing, you know, not just reading your Bible, but going to church. We're talking about 30% less lonely by reading your Bible, 
Okay. That's, that's big percentage, a big payback, four days a week, 30%. That's, that's, that's great. And the next thing, making Christian friends, going to church and actually connecting with people. These are things that severely, severely lower your risk of suicide. I mean, so, you know, you don't get suicidal overnight, right? You, you understand this, right? It is a process. And uh, having people there in your corner keeps you from progressing down that way. They, uh, they did a, a series of studies on burnout as it applies to pastors. Pastoral burnout is what they called it. Burnout is where you just kind of, well, the, the name is the description. You're burned out. <laughs> you don't want to do it anymore. Uh, they did a series of studies, and they found in every single one of them that the, the pastors who were able to overcome their burnout were those ones who still found people to connect to. And every single one of the things. So you, you serve people all day. You get tired of it. You want to get a little bit of space. Surprise, surprise, <laughs> you actually need some real connections with people, not simply people that you minister to, but people who you can connect with. And that, in every single time, uh, was how the pastor found relief through the burnout. So, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about introverts this and introverts that. Here's the thing. I, I know that introverts withdraw, and if you don't know what an introvert is, don't worry about it. I'm talking to the people who do know what it is, and they use it as an excuse for everything, right? I don't want to go to the party. I'm an introvert. <laughs> I don't want to go to work today. I'm an introvert. I don't really want to talk to people. I'm an introvert. And so they just kind of use it as like a, a catch-all. Like, I really don't want to live life. I'm an introvert. Here's the thing, okay? Um, everyone needs friends, especially, well, let me let me come back to that. But everybody need, needs friends, even introverts, okay? So that means that, okay, well, I'm an introvert, okay, but you still have to have one-on-one -on -one contact with other humans. <laughs> like, you can't just be, oh, I'm an introvert, so I get to not talk with people <laughs> Now, now how it works. God made us all to be connectors. Some people are what's called extroverted. They talk to everybody. They have a great time about it. They think it's great. And as introverts, hate it. This is why I never go out to eat with my dad anymore because he's talking to the, to the waitress and everybody. I'm just like, you don't know me. Don't look at me. Just take my order and go. <laughs> but with that being said, everybody, even, even introverts, still need connection. The problem is that introverts connect on a different level. Extroverts can connect with a whole bunch of people. Introverts connect one on one. So if you're an introvert, don't don't do that bull crap, bull crap with me. I'm an introvert too. Okay, you still have to talk with people. Some kind of direct eye contact. You can talk to one person at a time. That's fine, totally fine. But that doesn't mean that you have to cut yourself off from the world. And I and now for the next little thing here. If you if you suffer from chronic from anything chronic, any kind of chronic pain, chronic illness of any kind, anything like that, chronic case of having children. Um, you you definitely, especially, really need to make make sure that you're connecting with people, and uh, and making sure that you put your kids to early to bed early, maybe maybe even five five thirty at night. You know, um, four. Who said four? I'll give you three thirty. Can I get a second? <laughs> oh man, they're sleeping all day, and then they get to be teenagers and they really do sleep all day. So suicide, here's the thing about suicide, though. Suicide doesn't start there at the moment of wanting to commit suicide. It starts with these little surrenders in your life, right? These little things that happen, and they kind of build on each other. One little thing is, is the loss of your spiritual encounters, right? So God made us as spiritual beings. As far as human history goes back, there's always a record of people worshiping something. Always. We were made to worship. We find things to worship if there's nothing to worship. So atheists tell us that there is no God. What do we do? We worship our money and our belongings. We always find something to worship. It's who we are. It's the core of our being. And when we start, we, when we start trying to worship things that were not meant to be worshipped, like things, great, here's a great example, the things in your house or money, we worship that. And when, when you worship things like that, it, it, it really leaves a hollow place in your heart. And... Um, so that's one of the little surrenders that you make that heads you towards the direction of suicide is spiritual death. Another thing is we, that we do is cutting, cutting off from people, right? While isolating, right? We hurt, we hurt, we experience pain. We lose a child or something, something serious happens with our health or something, so we withdraw. We want to we we hide the pain. We want to just, and, and to a certain extent, that's always going to happen. People, when they get really hurt, they, they always go to the corner and cry for a little bit, and then they're okay, right? Like, that's, that's a normal thing. But the problem is, is when you don't bounce back, when you stay in the corner, right? That's, that's where it gets to be a problem. When you isolate yourself, and it's not just taking a day or two to grieve, it's now becoming 
a week and another week and a month and another month and a year. It's well, you know, I know everybody has their own path to healing as far as the five stages of grief. I understand that I took introductory psychology too. You know, we all we all know that little bit. But here's the thing: there is still an element of having to push yourself through it. There is still an element. And I, I know that there's gonna be some people who say, but I suffer with this. I get that. I understand that. But there is, and I'm like I, I'm speaking as someone who's been there, there is still a point when you have to push yourself out. So we're gonna get to the Bible here in just a second. Don't 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 lose don't lose the plot here, okay, guys. It starts with little 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 compromises that you allow in your marriage. Instead of fighting for your marriage, you, you give up on your marriage. You you get a divorce. Instead of fighting for your job, you give up on your job. Instead of fighting on the and you think, what does a job and marriage have anything to do with suicide? Well, you'd be very surprised. These are stressful situations that cause a lot of stress in our life. And when we learn to give up in little things, we learn to give up in bigger things. Not that marriage isn't a big thing. But oftentimes, these kind of things lead to these other things. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say this probably again in a couple weeks, but I just want to say that suicide actually doesn't stop with suicide either, you know. It just hands the pain to somebody else. So, remember that. So, why shouldn't you give up? Heck, why even pray? Not, not just with suicide, but, but in life in general. Why not give up? In ministry, why not give up? Why keep doing the same thing to the same people if they just don't care? Like, why mess with it? Why, why, why not just be done with it? Why not live your life for yourself? Which is another form of suicide, I guess. Luke 18, 1 through 8 says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. See, we heard the first part, but the second part you wouldn't have caught unless I had already been talking about suicide, I guarantee it. Because I guarantee you that everybody here, well, not everybody here, half of the people here have already read this story, and you never once noticed that it said, and not give up, did you? You can't lie to me. Then that you should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice just so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So the question being, what on earth does Jesus' return have anything to do with praying for things? Now, hold on, hold on. Okay, you can't jump to the end of the story, guys. Hold on. There's a lot of things in between. First off, I want to say this, that when we stop praying, we start giving up. You could even say it like this. Your prayer life reveals what is happening inside of you. And it not just reflects it, it also molds it. I can guarantee you when a Christian starts getting to a place of giving up, they have already stopped praying. And I can guarantee you that when a Christian starts praying, he gets farther and farther away from giving up. I see it every time. Oh, well, you don't know what I'm, you're talking about. Actually, you'd be surprised how many people I've counseled. I've been in ministry almost 20 years now, and I'm telling you right now, I know what I'm talking about. When Christians start giving up, they stop praying. When Christians start praying again, they stop giving up. Remember the thing that I said about reading your Bible four times a week, 30% less likely to have the loneliness? Remember this? Okay, keep this in mind, guys. All, the, all those years when we were kids, they told us, the Bible told us, to so read the Bible. They weren't joking. They weren't joking. Seriously, read your Bible and pray. You'd be surprised. So we want these grand, elaborate, you know, real revelation, light from above kind of things. But it's really simple. Read the Bible so you know God. Pray so you talk to God. The rest just kind of works itself out, guys. After COVID, churches lost attendance globally. And a large part of that was because it was tradition. We oftentimes hold on to a belief, but don't do. You know what I mean? So there was a lot of people that were going to church before COVID. And then when COVID hit, they realized, oh, I can't go to church. And then they realized, whoa, whoa hold on. I don't really even want to go to church. Look at all this free time that I have. What am I even getting out of this? 
They were doing it out of tradition. It had no purpose, no value to them. So they just left church. They still consider themselves Christians. It's just that they don't go to church, and they're, they're happier that way. Or so they think. So, I mean, obviously, that's we know that's not true. You can't be isolated and be happy. Eventually, that, that whole island paradise thing gets very lonely and tiring. But anyways, <clears throat> so what we do is we hold on to a belief, but we don't do anything about that belief. Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, what, how, how would I know that you're a Christian? Well, because I said that I'm a Christian. I know what I believe in my heart. If your lifestyle is no different, you're not getting in, you're not seeking God, you're not serving God, your, your, your money is all about yourself, your time is all about yourself, you know, all you ever do is things for you. How is that being a Christian? In the Bible, it always connects Christianity with service, so, doing something, right? Taking care of widows and orphans, right? That's something that Christians do. Ties and offering, that's something that Christians do. Going to church, it actually says that's, that's one of the things that you should never give up, even more so as you see the, the, end of, the time of the end coming, drawing near. These are things that you these are things that make a Christian a Christian. And then it also says a lot about belief. But remember that most of the prophets are talking about people not doing justice. Most of the prophets, there's a big chunk of the Old Testament as prophets. Most of them were talking about Christians, or it wasn't Christians at those times, it was God's people, so Israel. Israel not doing the right thing, not watching out for people who are being uh, being taken advantage of. It wasn't because they weren't offering the right sacrifices. In fact, more than once the prophet says this, why are you wasting your time giving me sacrifices? You say, oh, I'm saved, I'm saved, but you're still not doing what I've told you to do. Read the prophets for yourself. You'll see it time and time again. So we hold on to these beliefs, but they don't, they're not really, it's not really a belief. It's more of just knowledge. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I know of Jesus. Well, if you, if we really believe him. We obey his commands. Isn't that what the Bible says? If we love God, we obey his commands. If we love God, we'll love people because who you, nobody can possibly love God who they have not seen if they can't love their brother who they have seen. But it's okay for us to gossip and complain <laughs> and to live our lives for ourselves and to, hate our, and to hate our job and to go around complaining about all the blessings that God gives us because it's not exactly what we want. And y You see, sometimes, well... What good is it if it doesn't change your lifestyle? What good is a belief if it doesn't change the core of you? Think about that. If a belief is just something that is in your head that has no physical expression, what good is it even? I can say that I love my children. That's easy to do. But if I don't make time to spend with them, how is that loving my children? I can say that I love my children and buy them all the gifts in the, in the whole world that I never had. That's not love. And those things will eventually rot and decay, but that time that I spent with them, that's, that's something that doesn't ever go away. See what I mean? I can say one thing, but if my actions don't measure up with it, what are my kids going to say? Dad's a liar. And it's the exact same thing. We can say a lot of things about God, and our belief in him, but if it doesn't change who we are, it's nothing. So when you grow as a Christian, you, you pray more and you become more dependent. See, when I was younger, I thought that as I grew in Christ, that that would meant that I would have been more self-sufficient. God wouldn't have to babysit me as much anymore. I wouldn't have to pray anymore because I would already know what's going on. I wouldn't have to read the Bible because I would already know what's in there. I, I wouldn't have to because... But the truth is, the more you grow as a Christian, the more dependent you grow on God. Which means the more you pray, the more you read the Bible, the more you serve others. See, boys want other people to take care of them. But men, men, God raises up to take care of other people. You see the difference between being a boy and being a man? You see the difference? And that's kind of what I'm talking about, between being a, a Christian and a Christian. There's a difference. It's not about you. And I'm convinced that a lot of the people who I got so mad at as, as a kid for, oh, the church is this and the church is this, I'm convinced that the people who I was getting mad at weren't really even Christians in the first place. They went to the church, yes, I know that, but I don't think they were actually Christians. They didn't serve people. They gossiped and complained about everything. They, they were mean, nasty people. They were nastier than the people out there in the world. They were just mean-hearted people. Those aren't Christians I was mad at. Those are people who were pretending. 
So let's go through this verse and see what we can possibly come up with as to why we should not give up. Jesus told his, par told, told his disciples a parable to show them that they should, not, should always pray and not give up, connecting the two ideas of prayer and not giving up. Okay, very important that he makes that connection. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor created what, nor created, no, I'm sorry, nor cared what people thought. I said that wrong two times. Um, and here's the thing. This judge is the anti-God. He is created, he, he's not real. He's created by Jesus to show you the exact opposite in every way. There is no element of this judge who is the same as God, except that he is a judge. That's it. That's the one thing. And the reason why Jesus does this is because it's called a severe contrast. He wants you to fully get who God is by showing you fully what he is not. Does that kind of make sense? So let's go through this. First off, God isn't just a good judge. So this guy is a judge, yes, but God isn't just a good judge. It goes more than that. He's not just an enforcer of rules. He is God himself. Completely just. In God, there is no injustice. It's not that God chooses to be just. It's that he is just. That's who he is. He cannot be anything but just. Does that make sense? This judge was an evil judge. He only did something good because he was backed into the corner and had to. But God's very character is just. He is the creator of order. He's not just the judge who, in, who enforces the rules. He's the creator of order. For those of you who are familiar with more of the scientific fields of, of creation, you'll know about the order, the different, the different laws of the universe, right? That things have to be a certain way, right? And that's what makes life possible. If any of these thousands of different things are even slightly out of alignment, everything just dies. A great book on this that was recently released uh, by an author named Stephen Meyer is called uh, The Return of the God Hypothesis. If you want to read more about it, you can. Um, and uh, so he's not just something who, 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 who follows the rules. He created the rules, and he, and he does this, and he does it because he cares for us. See, this judge didn't care. Have you ever met somebody who obviously does not like their job? You know what I mean? Like, 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 the, like the, um, the DMV lady, for instance, who's sitting back there, and she's like, take a number and sit down. I, I'm, look, I'm sorry. I really need help with this. I don't quite understand. Just take a number and sit down, and I'll help you when I get there. You know what I mean? It, it ruins a whole company because they don't like their job. That's not God. God is, is not the unhelpful guy behind the DM, in DMV counter. That's, that's not him. He's not this judge. In a certain town, there was, a, there was a judge. This is not a good guy who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. He's just, he just kind of a jerk going out there doing his own thing. That's not God. It's not that God cares what people think, but he cares about people. See what I mean? And, well, yeah. So then in verse 7, we'll get, we'll get back to this in a second. It says, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Just the intimacy of that, of that statement, his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? The implication here is one that he cares. So then we get down to verse 4, and it says, or I'll read 3 and 4. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Uh, widows are, are, were people who were despised in society. First off, if you were left as a widow, that meant that God had something against you, and so he left you <laughs> with nothing. And uh, so widows, in a way, it was okay to despise them. In a way. Uh, yeah, but they had a long list of people who was okay to despise, so <laughs> it's not really that big of a, of a leap there. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, and I think that takes, oh, right here. Even though I don't fear God or care what people think. And we'll, well, let's stop right there, okay? First off, he refused, this judge, he refused to care at first. See, it says she kept coming, and, and he refused at first. See, this judge was not good. He refused. He just didn't really care. But here's the thing. He had to be talked into caring. But God, God doesn't have to be talked into caring. You see what I mean? He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to like, well, should I care about this? This judge didn't know about the situation that the woman was going through, but God, God knows everything. So God, God doesn't, doesn't ignore our pain, and he cares, and he doesn't have to be talked into caring. So that takes us to verse 5, which 
sometimes we get the idea that we have to kind of manipulate God into caring about something. Okay, so let's look at this. It says in verse 5, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. I fear for myself. See, he had selfish reasons. But God, God has nothing to gain. And I want you to fully understand this. God doesn't answer your prayers because he, ha he has to. Because he has something to gain. Because he has to prove himself. No, he, no, none of those things. God doesn't have to. He has absolutely nothing to gain. The judge, now let me kind of clarify what I meant. When I say God didn't have to, in a way God does have to answer because in his goodness, it is, it is, un, it is unlike him to not care. He cannot not care. Okay? And in fact, the Bible puts it like this, that God sends rain on the righteous and the evil. He, that's just who he is. He, he can't not be good. It says that every good gift is from him. That means that he can't, he can't not. See what I mean? He, like, he, he can't be like, you know what, today, today I don't care. That, that's, not, that's not God. So, but God has nothing to gain. The judge feared retaliation, and he answered when bothered. Not when, you know, it was a, the right thing to do, just when he was bothered by it. Here's the thing. God... You can't retaliate against God. If you've ever lost a child, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're left in a place of absolute. You have nothing to, to offer. You have nothing to like cry out for justice. It's, 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 you're left in this situation. You just, I don't know what to do with this. You're in what's called a, 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 a ungrabbable situation. <laughs> you, can't, you can't claw your way out. You can't make it right. You can't fix it. You just have to experience this pain that is the worst pain you ever experience. And you just kind of yell about it. And there's not much you can do. <laughs> and if you've ever been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. God, you can't, you can't manipulate him into doing it. You are utterly powerless. In fact, apart from God's goodness, we wouldn't even be able to be saved. We are completely powerless in this process. But God can't be manipulated. You can't be bought. You can't do something to try and make him to do it. Oh, I've prayed the perfect prayer, so now God has to do it. I've lived the perfect life, so God has to. God answers according to his goodness, not according to we, what we deserve or some nonsense. He can't be manipulated or coaxed or anything. We can't get the one up on God. Verse 8, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Talking about God, not the judge. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So let's, let's, a few points and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, first off, God will eventually answer. And when he does answer, it will be quick. You could say it like this, long in the coming, short in the fulfilling. Make sense? When, that, when it says here, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. He doesn't mean quickly from the point of, Starting to resolution. He means when it comes, because it will come, no matter how long God, God and even says this, however long I delay, wait for it. God says that. But then when it comes, it will come quickly. So God will eventually answer, and when he does, it will be quick. For now, what do you do now in the, in the waiting? There's faith and waiting and trusting. Faith is where you trust God. You, you, you believe that he is who he said he is. Waiting is where you stop trying to figure it all out. And trusting is where you trust that he will do what he said he would. So why shouldn't you give up? Well, we looked at Luke 18, 1 through 8 tonight. Because God hears. We saw that, didn't we? God hears. He's a, he's a good judge who hears. He's a good judge who cares. God doesn't just hear and just like, eh, whatever. But he hears and then he also cares. But he also is good, not like this judge, the bad judge. He actually does care. And then the last is God will actually answer. He will see that they get justice. He will answer. That's a promise from God. Okay, God doesn't just abandon us. He will answer. And um, you, you might have some questions about that. Here's the thing. This is week one of a four-week part. Okay, Keep your pants on, especially because we're in public and that would be kind of gross. So. So why shouldn't you give up? Because it's about him. 
it was never about you. Why shouldn't you give up? Why shouldn't you commit suicide? Why shouldn't you just quit and throw everything away? Because it isn't about you. It's about him. It was never about you. It was always about him and his goodness and his glory. It always was. See, the problem is, is that we get focused on our problems, on our hurts. We get focused on our troubles, on our trials, on our pains. We get focused on all these things about us. Life didn't go the way that I wanted. Things happened that I didn't want to happen. Me, 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 me. And we think, I'm not being selfish. I'm experiencing something. I get that. And it's not wrong to have emotions. You experience all you want. But in your experiencing, remember that it's not about you and your feelings. It's about God's goodness. Because no matter what you feel, what's wrong with you, by the time that you die, and you will die, there is a loving God who will embrace you on the other side. You might be mentally ill. You might have a lifelong health problem. It doesn't matter. You don't give up because it's not about you. And when you reach the other side, he'll be there. He'll be there. You shouldn't give up because it's not about you. It's about him. So how does this apply to you? Well, first off, before I mention the application, I want to mention this again, just in case. Suicide hotline, they changed their number, 988. Eight, just like 911, 988, okay? So, anyways, why not give up? Well, here's something I, I want to just kind of throw your way. You know, when my my parents, they never got a divorce. They've only ever been married to each other. And one of the things that they said um, was that, you know, divorce was never an option. You know, it seems like nowadays divorce is always an option, isn't it? We marry someone we have in the back of our head that we can always get divorced. You see what I mean? We've already admitted defeat before we even get there. And that's something a generation or two didn't do as much. And, uh, well, oh, well, my grandpa got divorced. I understand that. I understand that there were still people who got divorced. I'm saying statistically. <laughs> statistically, people didn't get as many divorces. And because it wasn't an option. So I want to just throw something your way about why not give up. Well, and there's two parts to the statement. I'll start with a, just start with this. Stop asking the question, why shouldn't they give up? You'd be surprised what changing that one thing can do. You sit around feeling sorry for yourself, and you probably have good reason to feel sorry for yourself. But ask yourself this. In all that time of feeling sorry for yourself, has it made you feel any better? Has it changed anything? Are you better or worse for sitting around thinking about how bad you have it? I'm not saying you don't have it bad. I never said that. But it didn't help you get any better, did it? So instead, why not give up? Well, how about you stop asking that question over and over again in your head? Why shouldn't I give up? Why shouldn't I give up? Ask a different question. Ask this question. Why should I give up? Well, because this happened, this happened, so it already happened. It's only uphill from here. Well, what happens if something else happens? Well, we'll give up tomorrow. How about then? And then you wake up tomorrow, and you say the same thing over again. We'll give it tomorrow. And uh, you find these little ways of making it through the day, and you find these little ways of meeting God there. And uh, it changes things. Why shouldn't you give up? Well, stop entertaining the possibility that you can give up. Have a no-give-up policy. I'm not going to give up on my ministry because I don't give up. That's, that's something that I just, it's not, on, it's not on the table. See what I mean? I'm not going to give up on my life because that's not an option for me. If you've been through hell, you know the kind of grit that it takes to really dig down deep inside and find that you have nothing left to dig down deep inside that get. And so you find a new source of strength, and that strength, God, carries you through. And you see horrors that you can't even possibly imagine. But it doesn't end there. You find a way to make it through. God instructs us to pray, and if you notice in the verse, he actually said day and night. Look at this. It's in verse, I think it's in 7. Let me see. We're going to go back eventually. Watch. There it is. There it is. Who cry out for him day and night. I'm convinced that one of the problems why we don't see God answering prayers is because we pray something like this. God, help me have a good day. Amen. See what I mean? Not that there's anything wrong with asking for a good day, but there's no crying out for God. There's no expecting God to show up on the scene. 
There is no really heart to heart with God. God, I'm asking for a miracle. God, I'm asking that my brother would get saved. In a big way. I'm asking that when he gets saved, he would lead many others to you. I pray that you would change his outlook. I pray that you would change his situation. God, I pray that you would do something impossible. God, I pray that you would do something that he couldn't even imagine you doing in his life. I pray for his ruined relationships that they'd be healed. God, I, I pray that for his body that you would heal him. God, I pray that you would restore what's been broken. And then tomorrow, I'm going to pray again. And I'm going to believe that God is a God who hears and answers. And I'm going to keep praying. It's not the physical act of literally praying in the day and at the night. Like you have to wait for the sun to go down and pray again. That's, that's not the point. The point is continually seeking after God. Continually. Really seeking. And here's the thing. If you noticed what it said, did you hear what it said? When. When the Son of Man comes. When he comes. You have to reach a place of believing that he'll show up because he said that he'll show up. Do we believe that in these things that we're praying for, that the Son of Man, God himself, is going to show up in it? Or do we pray a prayer just because it sounded like the cute thing to do? When he shows up, and that's what it has to do, I'm convinced. I'm convinced he's talking about the way that God literally shows up on the scene and changes everything. You might say, I've never seen that happen. I've prayed, and I've prayed, and I've never seen that happen. I have. I have. And I'll see it again. You ask over and over, because he told you to. People say, well, why do, I have to, why do I have to keep praying if I've already prayed? I didn't say you had to say the same four words over and over again from rote memory. But why do you pray over and over and over again? And you keep praying and you never give up and you pray and you pray and you pray because he told you to. Because it works character in you. Because you change. Because your prayers change and because things change you see when you decide to give up you're robbing god because god made you 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 don't throw away gold you invest it you don't give up because you're gold god made you so and you invest that gold you spend your time praying if you can't do anything else. Oh, I'm, wor I'm worthless. I'm a waste of space. You can pray. Oh, well, prayer doesn't do anything. You want to bet. I know it does. Learn, learn for yourself. You might say, oh, I can't do that job because you compare yourself with others. God has a job for you. Sometimes it's praying. Sometimes it's doing heavy lifting and work and whatnot. Everybody has something different that they can do, and God has something for you. But when you give up, you rob God. And now we got a bunch of points that go from certain last month. Oh, they're two months ago. So just ignore those last ones. I'm going to go back to them so you can ignore them, okay? These ones, ignore those ones. Don't read them. These three right here, don't read them. These ones. You can read these ones. Not these ones. Okay? All right. Well, you weren't supposed to. Shame on you. I'm writing, I'm writing your names down in my prayer book. See, I, every week I, I, I tattle to God and I say, this person did this and this person did this. I'm just kidding. I don't really do that. But if I did, you'd all be on it. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives and through us.
God, I pray that you would encourage people um, through my words or, or just as they go home or as they're watching online or just anything, Lord, that you'd send people by to encourage them and help them help them to not give up, God. Help them to find hope in you. Help them to find um, new reason for living, new purpose in you, God. Awaken them to the things that you have created them to do. Lord, I, I know that when we get idle, when we, when we get, we're not, we're not doing anything, God, it gets very hopeless because you made us to be a people who does, people who do things. So, Lord, I pray for those people who are just real down on the dumps that they would get up and do. And, uh, Lord, that their belief wouldn't just be something in their head. It would be something that works out through their hands. And, uh, Lord, I, I just thank you for your word that you give to encourage us so that we wouldn't give up and stay in prayer. And we love you, Lord. Amen.